Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's one o'clock block on a given Thursday. And my co-host today is Ken Howe. And he is a journalist, investigative journalist, researcher, writer, interviewer, um, and a person who appears on movies about climate change and pandemics, among other things. And our special guest, Richard uh, uh, Shalarton. Hmm? Close enough? Shulartin, Shulartin. Okay. Um, and he joins us from Stowe, Vermont, and he's with uh, Spillover, Stop Spillover. And spillover is a very important word in this context because spillover is what happens when a disease uh, somehow mm, is created, you know, mutates, what have you, in the wild. Um, then it spills over into human populations. Before you know it, you have a pandemic. And that was one of the subjects of a the movie we made um, that Ken made uh, called um, Alarm, uh, what was it? Uh, Spiraling Crisis, uh, the Alarming Convergence of Climate Change and Pandemics, a postcard from the future. Uh, Ken, you know, we could put that to music, you know, several verses, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, Richard, you tell us a about- a lot of rhyming words with pandemic, you know, you might ask them. <laughs> well, it's on everybody's lips these days. Um, so, Richard, tell us uh, about uh, Stop Spillover and your organization um, and why you think we are at an intersection. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jay. Great to be here with you this afternoon. Um, Stop Spillover is a global consortium of 13 uh, really diverse uh, organizations uh, funded by the U.S. Agency for International development and led by Tufts University um, that's working really to understand and address the risks uh, posed by known zoonotic uh, viruses. Um, and those are viruses that have the potential to spill over from an animal into, into humans and cause uh, outbreaks of disease, epidemics, or, or, or pandemics like we're, um, like we're facing today. Um, and we're really excited to work uh, with this, um, this team at Tetra Tech. Tetra Tech is a global science, engineering, international development um, consulting firm. Um, and our role in Stop Spillover is really to help um, bring uh, the perspective of, of the interface between agriculture and food security and climate risk and, and spillover. So really look at what people are doing in um, the places where um, uh, zoonotic diseases might uh, might spill over into humans. So if you think about, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in agriculture, uh, pig farms or uh, on the margins of forests that are being um, cleared for um, for new fields or, or grazing for for cattle, those kind of areas. And so we're we're focused on on that aspect within a larger team that's looking at the really complicated picture of of what drives uh, spillover. Yeah, let, me give, let me ask you one more question that I think would be relevant to set the stage on this, Richard. <clears throat> How are we doing? Um, was, um, was the uh, current pandemic a result of spillover? Is spillover getting worse in our world where we are damaging the environment? So yeah, that's a great um, question. So COVID-19, COVID SARS-CoV-19, um, 19 uh, is a virus that's found in, in bats and, and other animals and, and almost certainly spilled over into, into humans. Um, there are many other viruses, um, e Ebola, uh, HIV, uh, Marburg, uh, to, name a, to name a few um, that have the potential to spill over. Um, and quite simply what we're seeing around the world is that we've got more people, uh, entering environments where animals um, and insects that have these viruses uh, live. Uh, we're degrading the environment, um, reducing their habitats. Um, we are uh, facing a climate crisis at the same time, uh, which as you and Ken know, uh, is changing the patterns of the vectors uh, where mosquitoes breed, for example, uh, where bats uh, live, uh, where insects are. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a significant increase in the risk of, of spillover. Um, 
and you know how are how are we doing and, there's yeah, clearly a lot of of work to do and that's why it's so exciting that we've got a program like stop spillover focusing on this now okay yeah, yeah i've got a question because you've got also a background in food insecurity right and and what what interests me is that um one of the ways these spillover events happen is that you've got particularly in poor countries that need food um they're you know, cutting down forests and changing the um the landscape uh, in order to provide food for themselves and 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 yet this is getting them ever closer to the vectors of some of these diseases so how do you balance you know some of these poor countries need to develop their food resources with protecting them and the rest of us from these spillover events how do you how do you deal with that hey yeah thanks ken i mean i think <clears throat> i mean not just for the risk of spillover but there are many many good reasons to help people uh, develop their uh, agriculture and food systems in, in more sustainable, healthy, um, climate smart um, ways. And so I, I think there's, there's a couple of answers to that, that question. One is about really thinking through what the future of our agricultural system will be and how that relates to our, our natural environment so that we're um, increasing uh, our production of food, and, and we need to. We need to increase the amount of food we produce by 50% by 2050 to feed the population. Um, but do it in a way that um, uh, restores the environment and forests and uh, sequesters carbon um, and protects, protects our water. So that's a very, that's a very long long-term process, and, and, and we certainly can't wait to do that. It's urgent to do that now, and it will require significant investments by, by countries themselves, by, by the international community, and by, and by private, private businesses to, to get us there. Um, but I think also there's a, there's a really important aspect of, of this, which is about um, being able to support poor and vulnerable households, small farmers who live around the world who are exposed to climate uh, shocks and, and many other, um, many other um, challenges um, to better deal with um, those shocks to become more resilient. And so if, if you think about what we can do to better <clears throat> um, uh, warn of droughts and floods and storms and, and the impact of those on people's food security um, and the systems we can put in place. Um, <clears throat> think about um, school feeding programs for kids that keep them in school and keep them, keep them fed, uh, or nutrition programs for, for kids who, who are in a drought-stricken um, area. If we can make those systems more effective and more responsive to um, climate stress from, from droughts and floods and storms, um, then households won't have to resort to the behaviors which increase spillover risk. So what happens, for example, is that, um, you know, when, when there's a drought um, and your maize crop or your cassava crop doesn't, <clears throat> um, doesn't yield what you need, then you hunt more. You go to the forest, you hunt for bats or wild food, um, and in doing so, you increase your um, interaction with animals or, or insects that are hosts of um, zoonotic viruses, and you increase the risk that there's a spillover event. So if we can do things that help, um, <clears throat> help people uh, maintain their food security and, and, and weather the storm, um, then, uh, then we can reduce the, the risk. Um, there are other, <clears throat> I think there are other things that are really kind of key that we can do. I mean, one of the first, the first time I, I really kind of started to understand the connection between zoonotic disease and, and climate um, was, I, I don't know, 15 years ago, I was trying to understand what the impact of El Nino was in, in East Africa. And one of the things that I learned is that <clears throat> when you have an El Nino, event, uh, quite often um, the rainy season at the end of, of our year, so in October, November, and December, uh, which is usually a very short, not very significant rainy season uh, in East Africa, extends, and it can go six six to eight, <clears throat> eight weeks. And 
in some ways that's good because there's good pasture and rangelands for animals, but it's also six weeks is the amount of time that the vector for Rift Valley fever needs to incubate. And so <clears throat> uh, almost inevitably when you have an El Nino, um, you, you have this very high risk of Rift Valley fever in, uh, in East Africa. And that, um, that causes all kinds of, of issues, not just the spillover to humans and, 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 the, um, and the health challenge, um, but also it has a massive food security impact because um, countries ban the export um, an import of livestock, which is the main livelihood of many people there. And so there's this huge knock-on economic effect, which causes all kinds of other problems. And so if you think about what we can do now in terms of forecasting the impact of something like El Nino on floods and, and rainfall in East Africa, and how we could link that to things like quickly scaling up um, preventative veterinary care to vaccinate animals against Rift Valley fever, then, then you start to see the kind of really proactive things we can do to manage those shocks now um, while we make room for the long-term investment in a more sustainable, healthy um, agricultural um, system uh, as, as we go. So we got to manage the, the short-term shocks and risks now while we take care of the long-term challenges urgently. Yeah. You know, one of the... Uh... One of the interesting strategies um, that I was reading about was, um, you know, Peter Daszak's Eco Health Alliance, um, and he was talking about um, setting up kind of monitoring stations in areas of the world where a lot of these zoonotic diseases come from, whether it's, you know, largely Southeast Asia and Africa and, and other areas, tropical zones mostly, and 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 getting very trying to get very close to the emergence, the first emergence of the disease, to have sort of monitoring stations that would be very close to where these things start. And that, that would give um, scientists and, and, and doctors a head start in, you know, in, in finding them and figuring out ways to, uh, to thwart them. Is, is uh, Stops Villalo or, or your, your company, Tetra Tech, um, involved in any of that? Or, is that, or is, do you think that's an interesting strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we definitely need more information on a whole range of, of factors to, to be able to not only detect when when spillovers occurred, which is obviously a huge challenge in many of the places that we're we're talking about, but but also to, to predict it eventually so we can take preventative um, action. So stop stop spillover um, really has three three main strategies that it it's trying to, to use. One is just understanding the risk factors that contribute to spillover. And so um, a lot of work uh, is being done with local, local partners. And that, by that, I mean you know, local, local governments and national governments, but also local universities, uh, local nonprofits, um, development agencies working, working in those um, in those places to identify, well, first, where the highest risk locations are for uh, spillover, um, and then really prioritize what, what, what do we need to know to understand better what that, what that interface looks like, what are the pathways for um, the virus to go from, from an animal to a, a person, and, and, and that's different everywhere. And in some places, it, it could be on a, on a poultry farm. In another place, it could be out, out in the forest uh, hunting. And in others, it could just be sleeping in your bed at night and getting bitten by a, a, a mosquito or, or being exposed to you know, uh, rodent droppings uh, that, that, might, that might carry the, the virus. So then from there, um, we <clears throat> work with local partners to, to develop um, interventions um, that help us monitor what's happening, detect what's happening, um, reduce the risks, um, both, both in the long term. So think about rehabilitating a wet market so it's more sanitary, um, but also in the short term to be able to kind of mobilize the public health uh, or veterinary um, authorities in, in a country to, uh, to deal with. Uh, with a problem, um, and then the the third the third thing that, that, that's I, I think really important for for making this all work is is learning, um, assessing, 
uh, which uh, risk reduction practices, um, which policies ultimately work in preventing uh, spillover and, and mitigating the spread of disease when it when it happens, and and all of those things um, really rely on having good information and data um, on on a range of things. Climate, of, of course, is 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 one of them, um, but um, yeah. So we're we're doing a lot of work to try and systematize that kind of data to help improve data collection uh, methods. Um, rely on you know mobile mobile devices to collect data or crowd crowdsourcing data so we can um, expand it but do it in a way that's that's rigorous and, and scientific. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd like to ask you. Uh, you have you have USAID, you have Tufts University, um, you have Tetra Tech. Um, I, I don't know if there's more members of the consortium. But what, yes. what, what are the respective members of the consortium do and how do you get the boots on the ground to go out into sometimes remote places and remote continents and actually affect uh, social conduct there? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. So as I said, there's there's 13 um, consortium uh, members um, with the overall project funded by by the US Agency for International Development. Um, it includes the Africa One Health University Network and, and their equivalent in Southeast Asia, the Southeast Asian University Network. So there's a lot of kind of on the ground uh, researchers and, and students within those uh, within those partners. It also includes um, local organizations like Right Track Africa. Um, and then and then a number of kind of global research institutions uh, like um, um, the University of Glasgow Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health, and, and Comparative Medicine, uh, UCLA, the Broad Institute at MIT and, um, and Harvard, ne University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, humanitarian open street map, because it's such, spillover is such a complicated issue that, that links to so many different aspects of society that the team itself is really broad and brings different um, different perspectives. And so we've got that kind of global team working then with uh, country teams where uh, over the next five years going to work in 10 countries. During the first year, we've got four countries that are up and running. That's Bangladesh, Uganda, Liberia, and Vietnam. And so there's a team in each country with, with staff working with local partners. Um, and then that team goes through a, a very kind of participatory a planning and prioritization process with local local authorities and, and local partners. We call it outcome outcome mapping because we're really focused on trying to identify what are the kind of behavioral outcomes we need to change to prevent spillover. Um, and then we come up with our action plan from that and we pull all the capacities of the um, of the consortium uh, together. And quite a number um, Quite a number of the consortium, also like like Tetra Tech, um, like uh, JSI International, um, have uh, presence in these countries or, or already. Tet Tetra Tech has twenty two thousand um, staff working in four hundred offices in ninety countries. So we're you know we we provide a lot of kind of on the ground knowledge and experience of how to operate in in those countries and and uh, and get. Oh. Ken, are you impressed yet? I am. Uh, you know, one of the things that Ken, that Ken did is he interviewed uh, Rita Caldwell, was it? Uh, who is a scientist, a biology biologist, uh, very you know well known, and she talked about modern methods of identifying where disease breaks out globally, and she had some very sophisticated, high tech ways to do that. Um, including, you know, developing information, developing a database on crowds. How do you develop a database on crowds? Hmm, cell phone traffic. Um, and I mean, there were two or three other things that she mentioned when uh, Ken interviewed her. Uh, it, 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 she'd be somebody that could help you get this data together. It sounds like a good part, since it's global, it's like a good part of what you're doing is gathering data from various places and then watching the changes in that data, and then trying to learn, you know, the common denominator, you know, the spillover phenomena, 
uh, and then developing systems that work, which you don't know sometimes if a system is going to work until you try it out. <laughs> so uh, I guess my, my question is um, uh, to Ken, really, do you, you think that Rita Caldwell could, could help uh, spill over, stop spill over? Um, well, she's probably working in related fields. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, one thing that that intrigues me a little bit is that so far we've been sort of talking about, or at least the implication is, man, we're talking about village life or, you know, bush markets and things like that. But I mean, one of the, one of the biggest causes of like of, um, deforestation are major like palm oil plantations and and the degree to which countries like oh Indonesia are, are and 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 others are sort of dependent on these mass you know farms how do you wean them of that uh, because that's not only a an issue for climate change but particularly with uh, the the palm oil here they're not only destroying natural habitats where a lot of these wild animals live but in the case of bats providing sort of a feeding ground for these bats. And I mean, that's, um, how do you approach that situation? Yeah, I think that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a big, big question in, it, in, it, in its own, own right. I mean, <clears throat> first, first maybe to, to, to come back to Jay's um, point, you know, it is so exciting to see kind of the, amount of data that um, we're starting to be able to access in developing countries to better understand and, and, and even more exciting to better connect people with, with services and markets and the information they need to, to thrive. Um, and that certainly is giving us a lot of kind of analytical power that we've, we've never had before in, in developing countries. That said, a lot of the places where spillover risk is highest are the, um, the least connected places, the places uh, where only wealthy people have mobile phones if, if they're a mobile phones or, or, or internet connection. And so there's still a tremendous need to um, improve our understanding and availability of, of data in those places um, to, to really know what, what's going on. And, and, and so, you know, better digital inclusion obviously will, will, will help in the long run, but, but we can't just rely on, on big data in those, in those places. I mean, if you think about the, the forests of uh, Eastern, Eastern Congo, um, it's hard to, hard to get data from those places. So trying to figure out how to, how to really address that information gap is a big, a big part of what spillover is. Well, to, to, to that point, Richard, we've been doing a number of shows with an organization called uh, Transitional Justice. <clears throat> and they're interested in atrocities, war crimes, and the, uh, uh, the Court of Criminal Justice in The Hague. <clears throat> they talk about uh, failed states and failing states. They talk about dictators who, um, you know, uh, with, with militia, they go out and, and, and involve themselves in genocide. Still happening still happening. You know, the world is a dangerous place these days. There are a lot of displaced people, a lot of unhappy people and unhappy governments. And here's USAID out there trying to get data in places that are, you know, not necessarily friendly to the United States or for that matter, friendly to any global effort, uh, even though it's obvious this effort is intended to help everyone. Um, so how do you deal with what do you want to call it, political resistance or the lack of political cooperation uh, in these remote areas? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I mean, that's a really important question, Jay. We, I mean, we, we have uh, many projects in, you know, in countries that are classified as fragile or, or, or failed states where we really focus on working with communities and people themselves to support their um their aspirations and their and their dreams and build their their capacity so even in the absence of a state that's that's functioning you can still do really meaningful uh development work to, to help those um those households for, for example in in eastern um democratic republic of congo we're, we're working on another usaid project to help uh, especially women coffee farmers improve the production of high quality coffee and, and export it 
so they can improve their their incomes and and be be more resilient uh, to all kinds of shocks and stressors and and doing in in a way that builds community cohesion and reduces conflict. So you know I think the work, especially of USAID in those environments, to try and improve people's lives is is a you know key part of a sustainable way to uh, ultimately end those those conflicts. But we do have more. Uh, refugees and displaced people in the world today than we have since the end of the Second World War. It's a, it's a major. It's well, a major. in the Ai Weiwei movie called Human Flow, he estimated 65 million, maybe now more. It was because the movie was three, four years ago. Maybe 70 million people are um, in camps behind barbed wire <laughs> with no prospects of leaving or having a normal life. And that, and that is especially so in places uh, that are um remote yeah and i think you know working in those places is obviously a, a challenge but that's that's why you know for stop spillover this whole process of being very um participatory from the beginning in uh, working with a wide range of stakeholders to figure out what local priorities are and help facilitate local partnerships um and solutions that address kind of the core drivers of the issue uh, in that place is is so important because the last thing you want is is a global expert coming to a village in vietnam or liberia or or uganda and saying this is the way you should you should do things we learned a long time ago that that doesn't work but but going and trying to um, help facilitate uh, locally driven priorities, build capacities and knowledge and 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 skills uh, in local institutions, um, and then and then supporting that that process. That can be really really empowering and and really effective, even gratifying. Uh, you know, uh, what about Ken and me? Suppose we want to sort of relive the days of our youth and do kind of a, a Peace Corps trip. Uh, a Peace Corps with stop spillover, uh, <laughs> where we, we go into remote areas and we go to the village level and we try to help them and explain to them and change their social arrangements to, um, you know, improve their prospect. Ken, are you ready? Uh, oh, well, I was, yeah, be sure to write me regularly and talk about the progress you're making. <laughs> Oh, well, I do. I do know the Peace Corps. Peace Corps welcomes volunteers of all ages. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Peace Corps spouse myself. I met my wife when she was in Peace Corps. Is, that right? um, hey, you know, no, just, is there a job there? Is there? Is there? Can I sign up? Can somebody sign up? Is this the modern way of looking at Peace Corps? Because it sounds, you know, like a, a wonderful contribution <laughs> to, to to global climate change and and global <clears> health. Yeah, I mean, definitely there are, there are ways to get involved in stop spillover that that I would say are, are you know much more about spreading awareness, uh, sharing um, on social media um, the the lessons and 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 progress that that we're making. Um, I would say those are really good ways to be involved. Um, probably not jumping on a plane and going to Uganda to volunteer, uh, at least not not yet, Jay. I don't think they need more aging white guys. I think we're doing better doing what we're doing here. All right, you can put your but passport think, you know, away. The other, the other thing that I would I would say in in all seriousness is, and and I and I think we've all learned this with with COVID, spillover is not a remote problem in an African or Southeast Asian jungle. Spillover is a risk that affects all of us, has global and catastrophic consequences. Um, and so, you know, letting letting public officials know, Congress uh, men and, and, and women, um, that supporting this kind of investment through USAID uh, in keeping us all safe is important. That's something that everybody um, everybody can do. You know, we have a couple of questions from viewers, and I want to try to get uh, get to them here. Uh, let me read them. One of them I understand, the other one I'm afraid I don't. Maybe you will understand them. <clears throat> First question, there have been accusations that the COVID pandemic was uh, initiated intentionally. He's not saying where or why or who. What sort of mental, this is a rhetorical nasty question, what sort of mental case would create a spillover that cannot be contained or controlled? 
such as uh, COVID. I mean, would anybody do that? It sounds like weaponization. How far away from spillover from the wild is weaponization? Gosh, I don't, <clears throat> I mean, to be honest, that's not, <laughs> Maybe this is a dodge of the question. I apologize to the the viewer. It's not it's not really my my area of uh, of expertise. I mean, I think the fact is, regardless of whether any of those theories are true or not, um, spillover is real. Uh, spillover happens naturally all the time. Um, you, you know, and and you don't have to look far far to to see it. Uh, MERS, SARS. Uh, avian influenza, HIV AIDS, um, all, all of these are spillover uh, events. And so, you know, we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll be debated exactly what, debating what exactly the origin of COVID-19 was for, for, for decades or, or, or longer. Um, but, but the fact is uh, we, we, need, we need to learn that, that spillover is real and we need to be very proactive about understanding where the risk is highest and helping those communities uh, reduce the drivers of, of spillover. Yeah, Ken is not gonna disagree. <laughs> to what extent do you think that, that, um, that, that, that we in the developed world have you know, kind of direct responsibility for some of these issues? I mean, it's, we're the ones that are sort of exporting our needs in terms of you know, food and, and, um, uh, and, and, and other commodities uh, for you know, poor countries to fulfill. Um, so can you reflect on that issue? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a critical question. And you know, it's, it's maybe good, good timing. We've got the UN um, Food Summit coming up to, to yeah. discuss that and, and the climate change um, negotiations in, in Scotland coming up at the end of the year where, where those kind of issues will, will also be um, discussed. And, and that, that's true. Our consumption patterns drive the global, the global food system and the global agriculture system for, for not just for food, but also for, for fiber, I think cotton uh, and feed for, for, for animals. Um, and so unless we have a significant uh, shift in our global food system to a more sustainable um, and climate smart um, food system, then, then the risk of, well, not just um, spillover, but biodiversity loss, climate change, um, increased intensity of, of climate disasters when they, they do happen, um, will will increase. And so that means, yeah, changing our um, agricultural practices um, as well as our, our consumption patterns. And so, I mean, there's a lot of really great uh, examples of how that can be done out there, but quite frankly, um, we need to scale them up uh, at a pace um, that I'm not sure we, we really appreciate if we're going to deal with, um, with all of these challenges. Um, you know, the other, the other question, I think I understand it a little better now. The preface is that, as Attenborough says, over hundreds of thousands of years, nature has found a way to balance. And it's our job not to disrupt the balance, which we are certainly doing. But then the process of nature is always to seek balance. That's what nature is, seeking balance. And I say that as a preface to what I believe this question is asking. He says, thinking globally, systemically, is it possible that the ecosystem creates virus spillovers or allows them to bring the system back to a kind of homeostasis balance. In other words, we let it happen, let the, the spillovers happen, let the viruses happen. At the end of the day, the world and the species will be at a kind of, maybe you don't like it, but a kind of balance through nature. He, I, I mean, you know, na nature, I, I mean, I, I tend to, to agree, nature tries to find the, the balance. I, I think the question is, do we want to live in uh, on a planet where nature um, is rebalancing um, 
our um, our access. And and I certainly don't, and I don't want my my kids kids to. Um, you know, climate climate change itself is is a great example, and it's a, it's a hard thing for I think to to really get your head around because when when we talk about climate change, we talk about um, a change in the average, and the average global temperature to any individual is, is almost meaningless. But when all of a sudden uh, I get hit. Uh, three times in as many years by a category five hurricane, climate change is really real to me. Um, and nature may be uh, trying to find its equilibrium, um, but it's not, um, it's not an equilibrium that I, I personally want to live through. I would much rather that we, we put in the effort to address aggressively the challenges of climate change so that our kids uh, can live on a planet that's habitable uh, rather than the other way around. And I, I think that's also one of the things that is really important for, for people to understand is, especially with, with climate, is uh, the science is very conservative. You know, we, uh, because it's controversial, we're quite conservative about the science. But if you dig into what, you know, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Climate Change Panel, uh, has said in its latest science report released a few, a few weeks ago, they confirm what we've known for some time, that climate change is accelerating, um, that our um, goal of reaching a limit of 1.5 or 2 degrees of global warming um, is um, going to be extremely difficult to attain, um, and that things are accelerating faster than we thought before. And that, to me, is really scary. The acceleration of, of change in the environment, in the climate, um, in our interactions with, with zoonotic disease is it, really scary. And I, I think we need to kind of take um, our current situation with COVID as a bit of a wake up call to, um, to, get, to get serious. And that, that doesn't, you know, doesn't, um, uh, doesn't mean we have to stop doing everything we're doing. It just means we have to really seriously change the way that we do things mm, so that yeah. we um, support sustain sustainable a sustainable um, ecosystem um, and society. Can, can, can you can you respond? Uh, we're almost out of time, and uh, try to summarize what this means to our viewers. Uh, I'm not sure I can. <laughs> I mean, we've been talking about climate change and um, and the spread of zoonotic diseases. Um, and uh, we've been going through a number of, of ways that people, scientists are trying to, um, to, to grapple with this problem. Um, I guess what I would prefer to end on is more, what do individuals that may be viewing this do? I mean, is there any actions that, you know, just normal people can take that's within their, within their powers and abilities? Um, because we've been talking about massive problems and oftentimes issues that are thousands and thousands of miles away. How do we how do we bring this into the living room? What can I do today or tomorrow? Do I turn into a vegetarian? Do I buy an electric car? Um, those are serious options. But I'm wondering, what do you know? What do, what can individuals do? Um, yeah, I think that's a great. Great question, Ken. I think there's lots of things we can we can do ourselves as as individuals. Um, be careful about what we eat, what we buy, how we travel, um, and and I think you know people have been trying for for some time. I I really believe that that people want to solve these problems and don't want to be the cause of, of problems. But I would, I would say that, you know, we're at the point um, with climate change, especially where individual action is not enough. It's, it's not enough for, for me to buy sustainably 
produced palm oil products or organic uh, vegetables. That, that's really important and we should, you know, we all, we all need to de- do that. We need to support our local for- farmers and support sustainable um, production, but we, we need significant uh, global coordinated action to transform our energy system, to transform our, our food system, to transform um, many aspects of our um, of our society, um, and that takes partnerships with government and the private sector. So, what can individuals do? They can really think carefully about how to how to get involved civically, how to uh, encourage their elected representatives to um, address these issues, um, how in, you know, in their work and their business to make partnerships with others that will help us move, move forward. Um, those, are, those are essential in addition to what we can do individually because individually we, 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 we can't, I don't think we can do enough. I've got my solar panels. I've got my electric car. I eat organic food, um, but I know that that's not enough to do this problem by my own. So we've got to we've got to find partners and 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 push uh, for for more systemic change. I'm sure that you realize that many of the things you're saying were said in almost the same words in our movie uh, that Ken made. It's really remarkable. The things you're saying are the same things. I I hear the words of Aaron Bernstein in my head, uh, Chip Fletcher. These are scientists that that Ken interviewed. You're saying the same thing. So I want to ask you one last question. It's a little tender. And that is what you've seen the movie. Um, What do you think of the movie, Richard? And, And if you liked it, tell us now. If you didn't like it, tell us after the show is over. Okay, well, in that case, I like the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I like shameless, shameless. <laughs> no, I think you know, I, I thought, I thought the movie was 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 really good, and and I and I, I particularly appreciated, um, you know, the fact that um, you were able to capture. Um, the long-term changes that are happening in our environment and and climate and their impact, the impact of climate disasters um, on people's lives and 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 our health, um, and the fact that many of the drivers of this are um, are pretty fundamental to our economy and, and way of life, and I I, I really appreciate that I. Um, come from a background of of disaster management. I spent most of my career trying to prevent and respond to food crises and famines around the world. That's what I've I've done for for most of my life. And I got into climate change because I was trying to understand why uh, in certain parts of the world, people were saying floods and droughts are getting more frequent and severe. Like, well, we used to get them every 10 years. Now we get them every four or five. Um, and I started to work with climate scientists, like the ones you, you talked to in the movie, to try and figure out what was going on. And it became really clear to me that um, the trends were um, were there, that, that more frequent floods, droughts, and storms were, were happening. You could, you could see it in the climate data. Um, and I was faced with the, the human consequences of that with kids not having enough to eat, being malnourished, and many of them dying in those places more frequently than, than, um, than before. And I, I, I think that really brought it home that it's not like the long-term change is important, um, but uh, it's the it's the extremes that happen along that road to a hotter planet that really are are the most dangerous. And I appreciate that you were able to bring that out in the in the movie and show you know what happens when when this flooding um, that increases people's exposure to poor sanitary conditions and diseases and 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 mosquitoes. Um, you know that that kind of um storytelling was was really was really good in, in the movie so thank, thanks oh, thank you richard uh, uh, ken what was the name of the movie again 
I'll, it's I'll say it for Ken. It's uh, the uh, it's a spiraling crisis, the alarming convergence of climate change and COVID. It seems to be truer every day. So, Richard, one last thing. What's your website where we can find more? Um, so you can go to stopspillover.tufts.edu. Okay. That's the best site to find out more information about Stop Spillover and all the great work the team is uh, is doing. Yeah.